Well, I'm enormously honored to be here in Belgrade and uh, would like to thank Adriana not only for helping to make this possible, but for her wonderful introduction. Indeed, I would like to thank all of those who invited me and who were very patient as I tried to organize my schedule to make this event possible. This evening, I would like to consider the relationship between vulnerability and resistance. We may think that either we are vulnerable or we resist, and that resistance consists in overcoming vulnerability. The short version of my argument is that resistance can be a way of mobilizing vulnerability, and that even fighting back or triumphing in a fight does not negate vulnerability. You may well ask what is at stake in such a discussion. I think many topics are at stake, including whether or not we are participating in social movements that seek to foreground and oppose the increased conditions of precarity. If we object to certain forms of induced precarity and vulnerability, then are we seeking to become invulnerable? Are we seeking to become secure? If not, then how do we approach these sets of terms in such a way that we can understand how they work in social movements opposed to increasing conditions of precarity? We surely know that those who gather on the street or in public domains where police are present are always at risk of detention and arrest, but also forcible handling, even death. So when we consider police violence against protesters, for, ex for example, the killing of 43 students assembled for a protest in Ayotzinapa, Mexico in September 2014, it is already more than clear that those who gather to resist various forms of state and economic power are taking a risk with their own bodies, exposing themselves to possible harm. That formulation seems true enough. Vulnerability is enhanced by assembling. But perhaps we need to rethink this sequence that gives narrative structure to our understanding of the relationship between vulnerability and resistance. According to our conventional way of understanding, first you resist and then you're confronted with your vulnerability, either in relation to police power or to those who show up to oppose your political stance. And yet vulnerability emerges earlier, prior to any gathering, and this becomes especially true when people demonstrate to oppose the pre precarious conditions in which they live. That condition of precarity indexes a vulnerability that precedes the one that people encounter quite graphically when they assemble on the street. If we also say that the vulnerability to dispossession, poverty, insecurity, and harm that constitutes a precarious position in the world itself leads to resistance, then it seems we reverse the sequence. We are first vulnerable and then overcome that vulnerability, at least provisionally, through acts of resistance. Of course, it will be important to establish a more precise relationship between vulnerability and precarity. They are not the same. But let us consider as a clear example modes of resistance that emerge in opposition to failing infrastructure. The dependency on infrastructure for a livable life seems clear. And when infrastructure fails and fails consistently, how do we understand that condition of life? We have found that that on which we are dependent is in fact not there for us, which means that we are left without support. Without shelter, we are vulnerable to weather, to cold, heat, disease, perhaps also to assault, hunger, and violence. It was not as if we were, as living creatures, not vulnerable, 
before when infrastructure was working, and then when infrastructure fails, that vulnerability comes to the fore. When movements against homelessness emerge, the unacceptable character of that vulnerability, in the sense of exposure to harm, is made clear. But a question still remains. Does vulnerability still remain an important part of that mode of resistance? Does resistance require overcoming vulnerability, or do we mobilize our vulnerability? Consider that a movement may be galvanized for the very purpose of establishing adequate infrastructure or keeping adequate infrastructure from being destroyed. We can think about mobilizations in the shanty towns or townships of South Africa, Kenya, Pakistan, the temporary shelters constructed along the border of Europe, but also the barrios of Venezuela, the favelas of Brazil, or the barracas of Portugal. Such spaces are populated by groups of people, including immigrants, squatters, and or Roma, who are struggling precisely for running and clean water, working toilets, sometimes a closed door on public toilets, paved streets, paid work, and necessary provisions. The street is not just the basis or the platform for a political demand, it is itself an infrastructural good. So when assemblies gather in public spaces in order to fight, against the decimation of infrastructural goods to fight against austerity measures, for instance, that would undercut public education, libraries, transit systems, and roads, we find that the very platform for such a politics is one of the items on the political agenda. Sometimes a mobilization happens precisely in order to create keep or open the platform for political expression itself. The material conditions for speech and assembly are part of what we are speaking and assembling about. We have to assume the infrastructural goods for which we are fighting, but if the infrastructural conditions for politics are themselves decimated, so too are the assemblies that depend upon them. At such a point, the condition of the political is one of the goods for which political assembly takes place. This might be the double meaning of the infrastructural under conditions in which public goods are increasingly dismantled by privatization, neoliberalism, accelerating forms of economic inequality, and the anti-democratic tactics of authoritarian rule and the violent combination of government and cartel interests. I wish to point out that even as public resistance leads sometimes to vulnerability, and vulnerability, the sense of exposure implied by precarity, can lead sometimes to resistance, vulnerability is not exactly overcome by resistance. It becomes a potentially effective mobilizing force in political movements. In effect, the demand for infrastructure is a demand for a certain kind of inhabitable ground, and its meaning and force derives precisely um, from the condition under which that ground gives way. So the street cannot be taken for granted as the space of appearance, to use Hannah Arendt's phrase, the space of politics, since there is, as we know, a struggle to establish that very ground. And Arendt is at least partially right when she claims that the space of appearance comes into being at the moment of political action. It is perhaps a romantic notion of an embodied performative speech act, since in any time or place that we act, according to Arendt, the space of appearance for the political comes into being. Of course, that's not always true. We can try to act collectively, and no space of appearance is established. And that usually has to do with the absence of media or particular ways that the public sphere is structured to keep such actions from appearing, zoning, permits, rules against congregating. 
Hannah Arendt clearly presumes that the material conditions for gathering are separate from any particular space of appearance. But if politics is oriented toward the making and preserving of such conditions, then it seems that the space of appearance is not ever fully separable from the questions of infrastructure and architecture. Although Arendt could not have formulated the relationship between contemporary media and the public sphere, for us, infrastructure now includes not only public media, but all forms of media through which and within which the space of appearance is constituted. This would include forms of media that constitute, mediate, and monitor the public. Media can function as part of infrastructural support when it facilitates modes of solidarity and establishes new spatio-temporal dimensions of the public sphere, including not only those who can appear within the visual images of the public, but those who are, through coercion, fear, or necessity, living outside the reach of the visual frame. What implications does this notion of supported political action have for thinking about vulnerability and resistance? I've suggested that the space of appearance of politics depends upon an infrastructure, so to act depends upon infrastructural support. I think we already know the idea that freedom can only be exercised if there is enough support for the exercise of freedom, a material condition that enters into the act that makes it possible. Indeed, when we think about the embodied subject who exercises speech or moves through public space across borders, it is usually to, presumed to be one who is already free to speak and move without threat of imprisonment or deportation or loss of life. Either that subject is endowed with that freedom as an inherent power, or that subject is presumed to live in a public space where open and supported movement is possible. The very term mobilization depends on an operative sense of mobility, itself a right, one which many people cannot take for granted. For the body to move, it must usually have a surface of some kind, and it must have at its disposal whatever technical supports allow for movement to take place. So the pavement and the street are already to be understood as requirements of the body as it exercises its rights of mobility. No one moves without a supportive environment and a set of technologies. And when those environments start to fall apart or are emphatically unsupportive, we are left to fall in some ways and our very capacity to exercise our most basic rights is imperiled. And we could certainly make a list of how this idea of a body supported yet acting, supported and acting is at work implicitly or explicitly in any number of political movements, struggles for food and shelter, protection from injury and destruction, the right to work, affordable health care, protection from police violence and imprisonment, from war or illness, mobilizations against austerity and precarity, authoritarianism and inequality. So on one level, we are asking about the implicit idea of the body at work in certain kinds of political demands and mobilizations. On another level, we are trying to find out how mobilizations presuppose a body that requires support. In many of the public assemblies that draw people who understand themselves to be in a precarious position, the demand to end precarity is enacted publicly by those who expose their vulnerability to failing infrastructural conditions. There is plural and performative bodily resistance at work that shows how bodies are being acted on by social and economic policies that are decimating livelihoods. But these bodies in 
demonstrating their precarity are also resisting their very pow those very powers. They enact a form of resistance that presupposes vulnerability of a, of a specific kind and opposes precarity. What is the conception of the body here and how do we understand this form of resistance? You understand me well enough so far? I'm not terribly complex, or maybe I'm complex. <laughs> All right, Emma, I'm going slowly enough. I speak fairly well for an American. <laughs> OK. A little humor, a little break. Um, if we make the matter individual, we can say, Every single body has a certain right to food and shelter, freedom to move and breathe, protected from violence. Although we universalize in such a statement, everybody has this right, we also particularize understanding the body as discrete, as an individual matter. And that individual body is significantly shaped by a norm, of course, of what a body is and how it ought to be conceptualized. Of course, that seems obviously right, but consider that the idea of the individual bodily subject of rights might fail to capture the sense of vulnerability, exposure, even dependency that is presupposed by the right itself and which corresponds, I would suggest, with an alternative view of the body. In other words, if we accept that part of what a body is, and this is for the moment, an ontological claim. I always feel like I'm sinning at that moment. If we accept that part of what a body is, is its dependency on other bodies and networks of support, then we are suggesting that it's not altogether right to conceive of individual bodies as completely distinct from one another. Of course, neither are they blended into some amorphous social body. But if we cannot readily conceptualize the political meaning of the human body without understanding those relations in which it lives and thrives, we fail to make the best possible case for the various political ends we seek to achieve. What I am suggesting is that it is not just that this or that body is bound up in a network of relations, but that the body, despite its clear boundaries, or perhaps precisely by virtue of those very boundaries, is defined by the relations that make its own life and action possible. Indeed, those relations that make its own life and action possible are those relations that make its own life and action impossible as well. We cannot understand bodily vulnerability outside of this conception of social and material relations. Of course, we also undergo a specific form of linguistic vulnerability. And in this sense, who we are, even our ability to survive, depends upon the language that sustains us. One clear dimension of our vulnerability has to do with our exposure to name-calling and discursive categories, um, those that lay in wait for us in infancy and childhood and that continue to affect us throughout the course of a life. All of us are called names, and this kind of name-calling demonstrates an important dimension of the Speech Act. We do not only act through the speech act. Speech acts also act upon us. There's a distinct performative effect of having been named as this gender or another gender, as part of one nationality or a minority, or to find out that how you are regarded in any of these respects is summed up by a name that you yourself did not know and never chose. We can and do ask with the great 19th century black feminist so Sojourner Truth, am I that name? How do we think about the force and effect of those names we are called before any of us emerge into language as speaking beings prior to any capacity for a speech act of our own? 
Does speech act upon us prior to our speaking? And if it did not act upon us, if it were not actively working upon us, could we speak at all? Perhaps it's not simply a matter of sequence. Does speech continue to act upon us at the very moment in which we speak so that we may well think we are acting, but we are also acted upon at that very same time? Eve Sedgwick wrote about the relationship between performance and performativity in consequential ways, showing that speech acts very often deviate from their aims, producing consequences that were altogether unintended and oftentimes quite felicitous. For instance, one could take a marriage vow, and this act could then establish a public recognition of marriage, which then allows or opens up a zone of possible sexuality that takes place quite under the radar, taking advantage precisely of its non-recognizability. The marriage vow provides public cover for forms of sexual life that remain unrecognized and sometimes happily so. In such cases, marriage organizes sexuality as we might expect, in conjugal and monogamous forms, but it also produces another zone of sexuality defined precisely by its lack of overt recognition in the public sphere. Sedgwick underscored the sense of how a speech act could produce consequences that veer away from its apparent aims, and this deviation was one sense of the word queer, understood less as an identity than as a movement of thought and language contrary to accepted forms of authority, always deviating and so opening up spaces for desire that would not always be openly recognized within established norms. Discourses on gender seem to create and circulate certain ideals of gender, generating those ideals, what we sometimes take to be natural essences or internal truths are ideals, phantasms, or norms that have taken hold of us in a deep and abiding way. So the ideals produced by a discourse, say, a set of gender ideals, can be inhabited in one's gestures and actions, even come to be understood to be essential to who we are, indeed abiding, abiding and governing images, norms, and ideals such as these cannot be cast off at will without losing a sense of who we are. That essential sense of who we are is, to some extent, the workings of a set of social norms. Having a sense of who we are essentially is not for that reason an argument for innate differences. Arguments from innateness constitute only one form of essentialism, and one can have a sense of what is essential for one's life without exactly being an essentialist. My early formulation that gender is performative became the basis for two quite contrary interpretations. The first is that we radically choose our genders. The second was that we are utterly determined by gender norms. <laughs> Those wildly divergent uh, responses meant that something had not quite been articulated and grasped about the dual dimensions of any account of performativity. For if language acts upon us before we act and continues acting in every instant in which we act, then we have to think about gender performativity first as gender assignment, all those ways in which we are, as it were, called a name, and gendered prior to understanding anything about how gender norms act upon and shape us, and prior to our capacity to reproduce those norms in ways that we might choose. Choice, in fact, comes late in the process of performativity. Following Sedgwick, I would add the following. We have to understand how deviations from those norms can and do take place, suggesting that something Queer is at work at the heart of gender performativity, a queerness that is not so very different from the swerves taken by iterability in Derrida's account of the speech act as citational, but which takes on specific embodied and social meaning in Sedgwick's view. So let's presume that when we're speaking about performativity, we're describing both the processes of being acted on, 
and the conditions and possibilities for acting, and that we cannot understand its operation without both of those dimensions. The norms that act upon us imply that we're susceptible to their action, vulnerable to a certain name calling from the start, and this registers at a level that is prior to any possibility of volition. An understanding of gender assignment has to take up this field of an unwilled receptivity, susceptibility, and vulnerability, a way of being exposed to language prior to any possibility of forming or enacting a speech act. Norms such as these both require and institute certain forms of corporeal vulnerability without which their operation would not be thinkable. That is why we can and do describe the powerful citational force of gender norms as they are instituted and applied by medical, legal, and psychiatric institutions and object to the, fact that, to the effect they have on the forma formation and understanding of gender in pathological or criminal ways. This very domain of susceptibility, this condition of being affected, is also where something queer can happen, where the norm is refused or revised, or where new formulations of gender begin. Although gender norms precede us and act upon us, that is one sense of its enactment, we are obligated to reproduce them, and that is the second sense of its enactment. Precisely because something inadvertent and unexpected can happen in this realm of being affected, we find forms of gender that break with mechanical patterns of repetition, deviating from, resignifying, and sometimes quite emphatically breaking those citational chains of gendered normativity, making room for new forms of gendered life. The theory of gender performativity, as I understood it, never prescribed which gender performances were right or more subversive and which were wrong and reactionary. The point was precisely to relax the, coerc the coercive hold of norms on gendered life, which is not the same as transcending all norms for the purposes of living a more livable life. So it seems important to distinguish here between two different actions of the norm. In the first case, the norm is interpolated, and it could be understood most easily in this context as the interpolating action of gender assignment. We are treated, hailed, and formed by social norms that precede us and which form the constraining context for whatever forms of agency we ourselves take on in time. We do not precisely ever overcome our formations. I'm sorry, that's a really bad bit of news, but I think it's true. We do not precisely ever overcome our formations, but we do veer from the apparent aims at times, and this means that finding a queer way and becoming an agent are somehow linked. But there's a second sense of norms, and those are not precisely counter to our sense of agency. They constitute the intersubjective and infrastructural conditions of a livable life. We hardly seek to overcome those social and material conditions of our lives. Rather, we seek to make them more just, more equal, more enabling. In relation to both interpolating and infrastructural norms, we are embodied creatures who are to some extent exposed to what we are called and dependent upon the structures that let us live. So whatever performative agency might mean, it cannot overcome these prior and constituting dimensions of social normativity. It is then here that I would identify both dependency and vulnerability as part of the performative account of agency. Indeed, the embodiment presupposed by both gender and performance is one that is dependent on institutional structures and broader social worlds. We cannot talk about a body without knowing what supports that body and what its relation to that support might be or lack of support might be. In this way, the body is less an entity than a relation, and it cannot be fully dissociated from the infrastructural and environmental conditions of its living. 
thus the dependency on human and other creatures, of human and other creatures on infrastructural support exposes a specific vulnerability that we have when we are unsupported, when those infrastructural conditions characterizing our social, political, and economic lives start to decompose, or when we find ourselves radically unsupported under conditions of precarity or under explicit conditions of threat. Both performance studies and disability studies have offered the crucial insight that all action requires support, and that even the most punctual and seemingly spontaneous act implicitly depends upon an infrastructural condition that quite literally supports the acting body. This idea of support is quite important not only for the re-theorization of the acting body, but for the broader politics of mobility what architectural supports have to be in place for each of us to exercise a certain freedom of movement, one that is necessary in order to exercise the right to public assembly. In the same way that we claim that the Speech Act depends upon its social conditions and conventions, we can also say that the performance of gender more generally depends upon its infrastructural and social conditions of support. This bears implications for a general account of embodied and social action, but also for understanding the bodily risks that women take walking on certain streets at night, assembling in public squares. Sexual assault would be a clear example. For understanding as well the risks that transgendered people take in walking on the street or gathering in public assemblies. As I have argued elsewhere, all public assembly is haunted by the police and the prison. And every public square is defined in part by the population that could not possibly arrive there. Either they are detained at the border or have no freedom of movement and assembly or are imprisoned. In other words, the freedom to gather as a people is always haunted by the imprisonment of those who exercised that freedom and were taken to prison. And when one arrives in public or common spaces with radical and critical views, there is always an anxious or sometimes a certain anticipation that imprisonment may well follow. Sometimes we walk or run knowingly in the direction of prison because, because it is the only way to expose illegitimate constraints on public assembly and political expression. The deliberate exposure to harm was crucial to Gandhi's notion of non-violent civil disobedience. Now, in Geze Park in Istanbul, some who were assembled there were detained and others were hurt. Some died. The lawyers who came to help those who were detained were themselves detained, and sometimes the medical workers who came to help the injured were themselves subject to injury. And yet a new group would arrive, new activists or journalists, health professionals, lawyers, replenishing the network of support. With the imprisonment of some of the Pussy Riot members after their cathedral performance in Moscow, demonstrations broke out in major cities all across the globe, and internet forms of solidarity emerged to put pressure on governments and human rights agencies to press for the release of those imprisoned and to object to the conditions of political imprisonment. Both of these examples and the growing movement against the death penalty compel us to turn our attention to political imprisonment and to the institution of the prison industry as a global mechanism for the regulation of the rights of citizenship, including the rights of assembly. In the United States, as you may know, two thirds of prisoners are black men and nearly every person on death row is a person of color. Angela Davis has argued that the prison in the United States continues the work of slavery by suspending the very rights of citizenship for people of color. In this way, it becomes the continuation of slavery by other means. I want to suggest that feminism is a crucial part of these networks of solidarity and resistance, precisely because feminist critique destabilizes those institutions that depend on the reproduction of inequality and injustice. It criticizes those institutions and practices that inflict violence on women and gender minorities, and in fact, all minorities subject to police power 
simply for showing up and speaking out as they do. We are now, of course, witnessing popular movements against the notion of gender in France and several Eastern European countries, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia. I don't know about Serbia. Yes? No. Okay. And, and these are allied with movements against reproductive freedom, gay marriage, against lifting constraints imposed upon women's literacy, employment, and expressive freedoms. Time and again, we hear from government authorities in several parts of the world that what women and minority populations consider to be basics of equality and freedom go against the common norms of a national culture, or that the goals of these movements are unrealistic or ungrateful, or what they call equality and freedom are actually dangerous, po po posing grave security risks to the nation or to Europe or indeed to civilization itself. The Russian government accused Pussy Riot of attacking the soul of man. Few struggles are more important than those that call into question the so-called common norms by asking whose lives were never included in those norms, whose lives are in fact explicitly excluded from those norms, what norm of the human constrains those common norms, and to what extent is there a masculine norm or a norm of racial privilege. I've suggested that we rethink the relationship between the human body and infrastructure so that we may call into question the body as a discrete, singular, and self-sufficient kind of thing. And I've proposed instead to understand embodiment as both performative and relational. Relationality includes dependency on infrastructural conditions and legacies of discourse and institutional power that precede and condition our existence. I'm also suggesting that certain ideals of independence are masculinist or belong to a, an ideology of radical individualism, um, and that a feminist account exposes the disavowed dependency at the heart of the masculinist and individualist idea of the body. This is different from saying what women's bo bodies are or what men's bodies are, I don't make those claims. I'm only showing what I take to be a masculinist conception of bodily action that should be actively criticized. My reference to dependency may well include dependency on a caretaker or a mother, but it's not the form of primary dependency that concerns me here. By theorizing the human body as a certain kind of dependency on infrastructure, understood complexly as environment, social relations, and networks of support and sustenance by which the human itself proves not to be divided from the animal or from the technical world. In doing this, we foreground the ways in which we are vulnerable to decimated or disappearing infrastructures economic supports, and predictable and well-compensated labor. We are then not only vulnerable to one another, an invariable feature of social relations, but this very vulnerability indicates a broader condition of dependency and interdependency, which challenges the dominant ontological understanding of the embodied subject. Of course, there are many reasons not to like vulnerability. Most of us wish we were less vulnerable under conditions in which we are impinged upon in ways we do not choose, and vulnerability names this condition. But that alone is no reason to reject a theoretical consideration of its uses, especially when it turns out that vulnerability cannot rightly be reduced to what we cannot willingly want. In the final set of my remarks, I want to argue against the notion that vulnerability is the opposite of resistance or indeed the opposite of action. I want to argue affirmatively that vulnerability, understood as a deliberate exposure to power, for instance, is part of the very meaning of political resistance as an embodied enactment. I know that speaking about vulnerability produces resistance of various kinds for the reason I have just mentioned. There are those who worry that vulnerability, even if it becomes a theme or a problem for thinking, will be asserted as a primary existential condition, ontological and constitutive, and that this sort of 
foundationalism will founder on the same rocky shores as have others, such as the ethics of care or maternal thinking. Some people worry that if feminism in any way associates itself with vulnerability, no matter which version, it will become captured by the term and women will end up being portrayed in ways that rob them of their agency. Does a turn to vulnerability seek to reintroduce those foundationalist or essentialist modalities of thinking and valuing, valuing back into public discourse? Is it smuggling in discounted paradigms for reconsideration? Does the idea of vulnerability work to the detriment of women? Or does that very question presuppose that any concession made to vulnerability will lead to vulnerability as a foundational premise for politics, which it's not, an essential identity, which it's not, or an identification of women with injurability or victimization, which I would argue is not necessary. All these concerns assume that vulnerability is disjoined from resistance, mobilizations, and other forms of deliberate and agentic politics. Such an assumption is at the basis of many of our political misunderstandings about the term, or so I would suggest to you this evening. Of course, the resistance to vulnerability is often based on political anxieties such as these. If women or minorities seek to establish themselves as vulnerable, do they unwittingly or wittingly seek to establish a protected status subject to a paternalistic set of powers that must safeguard the vulnerable, those presumed to be weak and in need of protection? Does the discourse of vulnerability discount the political agency of the subjugated and invite a kind of paternalism? So one political problem that emerges from any such discussion is whether the discourse on vulnerability shores up paternalistic power, relegating the condition of vulnerability to those who suffer discrimination, exploitation, or violence. What, what about the power of those who are oppressed? What about the vulnerability of paternalistic institutions themselves? After all, if they can be contested, brought down, or rebuilt on egalitarian grounds, then paternalism itself is vulnerable to a dismantling that would undo its very form of power. And when this dismantling is undertaken by subjugated peoples, do they not establish themselves as something other than and more than vulnerable? Indeed, do we want to say that they overcome their vulnerability at such moments? Vulnerability is negated and converts into agency. Or is vulnerability still there, but now assuming a different form? There are, of course, justified political objections to the fact that dominant groups can use the discourse of vulnerability to shore up their own privilege. In California, when white people were losing their status as a majority, some of them claimed that they were a vulnerable population. Vulnerable to what? A multinational and multiracial state. Such a claim was clearly racist. Indeed, colonial states have lamented their vulnerability to attack by those they colonize, and they've sought general sympathy on the basis of that claim. This still happens in our day. Some men have complained that feminism has made them into a vulnerable population and that they are now targeted for discrimination. Various European national identities now claim to be under attack by new and established migrant communities. We can see that the term has a way of shifting and since we may not like some or even many of the shifts it makes, we may find ourselves somewhat awkwardly opposed to vulnerability. Of course, that's a rather funny thing to say, since we might conjecture that any amount of opposition to vulnerability does not exactly defeat its operation in our bodily and social lives. Indeed, vehement opposition to vulnerability may prove to be the very sign of its continuing operation. That seems to be a minimal truth that we can accept from psychoanalysis. And yet, do our political objections to vulnerability make us into psychoanalytic fools and do our psychoanalytic affirmations of vulnerability make us complicit with political positions we do not condone? When we oppose vulnerability as a political term, it's usually because we would like to see ourselves as agents. We are acting. We think better political consequences will follow if we, are, if we see ourselves as acting. <clears throat> 
If we oppose vulnerability in the name of agency, does that imply that we prefer to see ourselves as those who are only acting but never acted upon? How might we then describe those regions of both aesthetics and ethics that presume that our receptivity is bound up with our responsiveness, a zone in which we are, yes, acted upon by the world, by what is said and shown by what we hear and by what touches us. If we take this domain of impressionability as primary, then we can ask what aspects of the world impress upon us at the very moment we form an impression of that world. What we find is at the same time that we act upon it in certain ways. Does the opposition to vulnerability imperil a host of related terms like responsiveness, impressionability, susceptibility, injurability, openness, indignation, outrage, even resistance? If nothing acts on me against my will or without my advanced knowledge, then there is only sovereignty the posture of control over the property that I have, the property that I am, a seemingly sturdy and self-centered form of the thinking I that seeks to cloak those fault lines of the self that cannot be overcome. What form of politics is supported by this adamant mode of disavowal? Is this not the masculinist account of sovereignty that as feminists we are called upon to dismantle? As I have tried to suggest by calling attention to the dual dimension of performativity, we are invariably acted upon and acting, and this is one reason why performativity cannot be reduced to the idea of free individual performance. We are called names, we find ourselves living in a world of categories and descriptions way before we start to sort them out critically and endeavor to change them or make them our own. In this way, we are quite, in spite of ourselves, vulnerable to and affected by discourses that we never chose. In a parallel way, I want to suggest there is a dual relationship to resistance that helps us understand what we mean by vulnerability. On the one hand, there is this resistance to vulnerability that takes both psychic and political dimensions. The psychic resistance wishes that it were never the case that discourse and power were imposed upon us in ways that we never chose, and so seeks to shore up a notion of individual sovereignty against the shaping forces of history on our embodied lives. On the other hand, the very meaning of vulnerability changes when it becomes understood as part of the very practice of political resistance. Indeed, one of the important features of public assembly that we recently have seen confirms that political resistance relies fundamentally on the mobilization of vulnerability. Vulnerability can be a way of being exposed and agentic at the same time. Such collective forms of resistance are structured very differently than the idea of a political subject that establishes its agency by vanquishing its vulnerability. That's the masculinist ideal we surely ought to continue to oppose. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, there are those who argue that vulnerability cannot be the basis for group identification without strengthening paternalistic power. I think that's right. I'm not suggesting that vulnerability be the basis for group identification. Once groups are marked as vulnerable within human rights discourse or legal regimes, they become reified as definitionally vulnerable, fixed in a political position of powerlessness and lack of agency. All the power then belongs to the state, the NGOs, the international institutions that are now supposed to offer them protection and advocacy. Such moves tend to underestimate or actively efface modes of political agency and resistance that emerge within so-called vulnerable populations. To understand those extra juridical modes of resistance, we would have to think about how resistance and vulnerability work together, something that a paternalistic model cannot possibly do. In my view, as much as vulnerability can, can be affirmed as a condition that we broadly share, 
We're all subjects to accidents, illness, and attacks that can expunge our lives quite quickly. It's also a socially induced condition, one accounts, which accounts for the disproportionate exposure to suffering, especially among those broadly called the precariat, for whom access to shelter, food, and medical care is often quite drastically limited. Even so, it would not be a sufficient politics to embrace vulnerability or to get in touch with our feelings of vulnerability or to bear our fault lines as if that might launch a new mode of authenticity or inaugurate a new order of moral values or a sudden and widespread outbreak of care. I'm not in favor of such moves toward authenticity as a way of doing politics, for it continues to locate vulnerability as the opposite of agency, to identify agency with sovereign modes of defensiveness, and to fail to recognize the ways in which vulnerability can be an incipient and an enduring moment of resistance. Once we understand the way vulnerability enters agency, then our understanding of both terms can change, and the binary opposition between them can become undone. I consider the undoing of this binary to be a critical task. So as I've spoken this evening, I don't, I hope I have not conveyed the idea that vulnerability is simply a subjective disposition. Rather, it characterizes a relationship to a field of objects, forces, and passions that impinge upon or affect us in some way. As a way of being related to what is not me, and not fully masterable, vulnerability is a kind of relationship that belongs to that ambiguous region in which receptivity and responsiveness are not clearly demarcated from one another. They're not distinguished as separate moments in a sequence. Indeed, where receptivity and responsiveness become the basis for mobilizing vulnerability rather than engaging in its destructive denial. Of course, I am aware that I have used resistance in at least two ways. First, as a resistance to vulnerability that characterizes that form of thinking that models itself on mastery. Second, as a social and political form that is informed by vulnerability and so not one of its opposites. I've suggested that vulnerability is neither fully passive nor fully active, but operating in a middle region, a constituent feature of a human animal, both affected and acting. I'm thus led to think about those practices of deliberate exposure to police or military violence in which bodies put on the line either receive blows or seek to stop violence by composing themselves as living barricades or uh, barriers. In such practices of nonviolent resistance, we can come to understand bodily vulnerability as something that is actually marshaled or mobilized for the purposes of resistance. Now, such a claim is controversial since these practices can seem allied with self-destruction. But what interests me are those forms of nonviolent resistance that mobilize vulnerability for the purposes of asserting existence, claiming the right to public space, equality, and opposing violent police security and military actions. We may think that these are isolated moments in which a group decides in advance to produce a blockade or to link arms in order to lay claim to a public space or to resist being removed by the police. And this is surely true, as it was in the, at the University of California at Berkeley in 2011, when a group of students and colleagues were assaulted by police forces on campus at the very moment that they were practicing nonviolent protest. Consider as well that for transgendered people in many places of the world, and women who seek to walk the street at night in safety, the moment of actively appearing on the street involves a deliberate risk or exposure to force. Under certain condition, conditions, continuing to exist, to move, to breathe are forms of exist, existence, which is why we sometimes see placards in Palestine that people hold up with the, with the slogan, we still exist. As we know, this is certainly true of groups who gather without permits and without weapons to oppose privatization and rally for democracy. Although such groups are shorn of legal and police protection, they are not for that re reason reduced to some sort of bare life. There's no sovereign power jettisoning the subject outside the domain of the political as such. 
there is very often a renewal of popular sovereignty among the subjugated outside of it and against the terms of state sovereignty and police power, one that often involves a concerted and corporeal form of exposure and resistance. Vulnerability can emerge within resistance and direct de democracy actions precisely as a deliberate mobilization of bodily exposure. I suggested we had to deal with two senses of resistance here, a resistance to vulnerability that belongs to certain projects of thought, sovereign projects, and certain formations of politics, sovereign politics, and a resistance to unjust and violent regimes that mobilize vulnerability as part of its own exercise of power. In political life, it surely seems that first some injustice happens and then there's a response but it may be that the response is happening as the injustice occurs, and this gives us another way to think about historical events, action, passion, vulnerability, and forms of resistance. It would seem that without being able to think about vulnerability, we cannot think about resistance, and that by thinking about resistance, we are already underway, dismantling the resistance to vulnerability in order precisely to resist. Thank you very much. I would like to invite you now to uh, post questions. I want to inform you that you can as well post questions in Serbian because there are, yeah, Judith has it. So I suggest that we collect three questions and then Judith answers them and. In this region which, which, which provides us with sort of incentives to, to, to use those concepts productively. My question is, is fairly minor. I wonder how good an example Pussy Riot is for what you are saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how nonviolent was the behavior by the members of Pussy Riot when they desecrated the Church of Christ the Savior in the middle of Moscow and when they went into the altar naked performing there? How nonviolent that was and whether that, was, that would be punishable by imprisonment in any country where you have a criminal law which says you can't desecrate a church. Uh, apparently, they had performed otherwise and in different places prior to that performance and they had not been arrested. So I, I just wonder whether this was a good example and, and if you could elaborate to that, on that, that, that might basically extend your arg argument a little bit. Thanks. There was, yeah. Uh, so I have a question about uh, interpreting contemporary migrations from Syria and Iraq uh, in terms of uh, vulnerability. And uh, another question is about, uh, would you consider that a crisis which uh, migrations caused is a crisis of uh, European Union in terms of crisis of their infrastructure to uh, enable life for migrants who are coming and is it a crisis for migrants whose uh, infrastructure for life was destroyed in their own countries? Mm -hmm. Thanks for this amazingly fecund uh, lecture. I have a question about the provocative distinction between what I believe you called interpolating norms and infrastructural norms. Uh, it's a bit of an abstract question, but I'll just state it as such. Uh, the question is whether a politics and an analysis of the dialectical relationship between resistance and vulnerability differs in relation to infrastructural norms and interpolating norms. And as an addendum to the question, I guess I want to suggest or uh, trouble the distinction a bit, uh, and I think here of Althusser's mise en scene of interpolation, where the policeman calls out, hey you, and you turn around, and of course there's that interpolating moment, but you're also on a street, right? There's an infrastructural surround, uh, and if you weren't on the street, if you were in your home, or perhaps in a theater giving a lecture in Belgrade, you would respond differently. So it suggests that from the perspective of particular bodies, the infrastructural and the interpolating norms are often simultaneous and indistinguishable. Distinguishable. Thanks. When um, Pussy Riot entered the cathedral in Moscow, um, it was uh, precisely to expose 
what they took to be the complicitous relation between the church and the state and to um, object to, um, to that relationship and to the censorious implications that that relationship has uh, on, um, uh, on, on art practices and on um, embodied forms of, of freedom, in, including sexual freedom and gender freedom. So um, they did not uh, destroy the church. They didn't hurt property. They, they did enter the church without an invitation, but a lot of people enter the church without an invitation. Um, and they did play their music there, and it was obviously offensive. Um, I'm not sure the church suffered a long-term desecration of some kind. I, I, we can give examples of desecration where churches are, in fact, burned or um, uh, substances are thrown or um, uh, altars are destroyed. I don't think that there was physical violence. I, but your question is a good one because in, in my, in, 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 uh, I think it, it brings us to the, to the very um, uh, profound and difficult question of what constitutes violence, right? Which is not so much at the core of this talk, although I am trying to think about that. Um, uh, um, at, at what point does an action which is considered by some to be deeply offensive and even contrary to religious norms um, get named as violent, even if it's not physically violent? And I, I think that we're on tricky ground there. Um, we could also ask whether censorship and imprisonment by the Russian government and um, in, in complicity with the church or psychiatric imprisonment or the internment of Pussy Riot themselves, at least two of them, for long-term um, uh, prison stints, whether that was, was not a form of state violence that was, in fact, much more severe than what you are um, calling desecration, and I'm, I'm still not sure it is desecration. But um, anyway, that's a complex issue, and I appreciate your, your, your raising it. Um, yes, I, I do think we can um, talk about migration and the current crisis of the migrant communities um, coming from Syria and Iraq and, and other neighboring areas um, as, a, as a, a failure of, of infrastructure. I mean, let's remember that bombing and war is, is, a, is one um, very sure way to destroy infrastructure and to make, uh, to produce toxic soil and to destroy irrigation systems and food sources. So yes, war is, um, is the systematic decimation of infrastructures. That's, that's one of its aims, especially aerial bombardment. Um, uh, but not only. So uh, that's, that's true. Um, uh, I think the question of whether there's inadequate infrastructure within the European Union is um, a really pressing one. Um, and here, I guess I would just raise a question. Um, there are, as you know, being in the, in the south of Europe, uh, there's some pretty strong um, uh, differences between the wealth of the north and the wealth of the south. There are some differences among the southern um, areas as well, I'm aware. But um, the, the question is, what is th those European nations with the uh, financial resources to produce infrastructure, are they, are they shouldering that burden and are they distributing their own resources to make it possible for others to um, uh, to, to welcome and help resettle migrants as well. I think there are political questions about when and where infrastructure is invested in and who has the funds to do it. I think there are some countries in the north that have a lot of funds, but it seems like investing in infrastructure for migrants is not a priority, right? So there's a political and economic decision. It's not just a simple given, oh, we don't have the infrastructural capacities. Um, it's, it's, it's a question of where people want to put their resources and what they consider to be profitable and whether the North wants to actually share its wealth 
with the South or whether it wants to subjugate the South by making it pay on payable debts. Open question. Okay. Um, so, oh, and by the way, the South keeps moving north. I don't know if we know what the South is, but it just keeps moving north, and pretty soon it's penetrating the north. Okay, just saying. Um, thank you for the really um, helpful uh, question about uh, interpolation and infrastructure. Um, your, your question asks me whether there is a distinction between interpolating norms uh, and infrastructural norms, and I think we can't make that distinction, um, quite, quite honestly. I, I mean, the way public space is organized, the way barrios are produced, the way global slums are produced, those are all interpolations. Those are spatial organizations of infrastructural life uh, in a way that produces uh, the marginal and the poor. So there, there's an interpolation in the infrastructural organization itself. You don't have to be called poor or called a name explicitly in language to understand that the spatial organization of your daily life places you and interpolates you in a certain way, where you can move, where you can live, what the, what, what, what the options are. So um, I think there are ways of thinking about um, spatial interpolation that uh, suggest a continuity of the infrastructural and the interpolating, not to say that they're always the exact same, they're not, but, uh, that, but there's a very important way to think about that, even the structure of, public, of what we call the public sphere who can appear in the public. I mentioned there are always those who cannot appear, they're, they're, they're perhaps the undocumented or perhaps those who live and the margins of the metropole, uh, uh, who or what enters the public sphere, who, who, who's detained, who's imprisoned, um, there, there's always that domain of the population that does not appear. So even the structuring of the so-called public sphere is, um, is an interpolation, especially if we say the people are constituted within the public sphere. That's not true. The people are constituted by the line that divides what counts as the public sphere and what does not, which means that we have to see how that line is spatially and politically articulated in order to get a sense of how these, this, this most uh, emphatic and fundamental interpolation, i.e., who is the people, uh, how, how that takes place. So I take your point, and I'm happy to become more of a materialist in, with time. <laughs> it's a it's a long it's a long road from where I come from, but I'm 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 heading there. You mentioned um, those living outside the reach of the visual frame, and I'm quite curious to hear a bit more. I have my own kind of interpretation of that. Uh, also, just a short question: um, when you say uh, that, uh, in a sense, we when we resist and act socially, we are vulnerable still, or we act from our very vulnerability and uh, support of the infrastructure that we are losing at that moment, and we fight to, to resist the losing of this infrastructure. Uh, but would we say that, in a sense, we still fight for invulnerability, in the sense that, uh, like when we uh, fight to have a health care, we fight to be invulnerable to disease? Wow. First of all, thank you for the interesting lecture, and my question refers explicitly to the case of Ayotzinapa you mentioned. Um, I wonder, or I would like to know what you think about the um, cyclic repetition of the vulner vulnerability of a certain group. What struck us in Mexico most when the 43 students disappeared was that they were on the way to commemorate Tlatelolco, the same thing, nearly 50 years afterwards. Is it? Uh, just a unique case, or do you see a uh, possibility of other movements repeat and uh, vulnerabilities repeating themselves in that way? You're all thinking very <laughs> intensively tonight. <I'm> <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great. Um, you know, I, 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 it's funny, the person who asked about what is meant by um, populations outside the reach of the visual frame, I, I mean, in a way, I, 
I put that phrase out there trying to understand what I might mean by it, but I'm, I'm, I'm very clear that even when there is um, a, a, a photographic war, uh, as, as we've seen in, in Tahrir or other places where uh, one group uh, stands and says, we are the people, we are the public assembly, and then another group is brought together just blocks away and there's another aerial photograph that says, no, no, this is the people, and the state media says, this is the people, and the other counter media says, no, this is the people. We get these kinds of wars, like which photo will um, appropriately or adequately represent who the people are. We could get involved in that fight, and there are good reasons to get involved in that fight, given that um, if, if one of those photographs is state-sponsored and uh, curated <laughs> and distributed, then we do have a problem. But, the, but what the fight between those two photographs misses is that there are many people who can't possibly be in the square, right? who, po who, are, who are not going to be included within the photograph. And we have to think about who's outside the visual frame. And they might not be in the photograph for all kinds of reasons. They may be at home, they may be ill, they may be disabled, they may be living far away and not able to get transport to what that square is, or they may, for various reasons, choose not to expose themselves to harm in the public square. So um, uh, there, there, are many, there are many reasons um, for, for that, but any group that is assembled in the public square and and given visual representation there is always um, uh, uh, um, only provisional and only partial. Um, so the visual, f we can't rely on the visual frame to give us the adequate um, uh, um, uh, representation of who the people are, even though we do need to fight those, those so-called photographic wars. Um, um, I don't think any life is in principle outside the visual frame. <laughs> I think the visual frame is constantly kind of making implicit kinds of differentiations between the representable and the non-representable. So we need to think about that and perhaps develop other kinds of practices that, that really interrogate that distinction and contest it. Um, um, of course, when we fight for healthcare, or we fight for shelter, we want to be made less vulnerable to illness, to injury, um, that is correct. Uh, I think it's one thing to fight to be less vulnerable, uh, and it's another thing to fight to be invulnerable. I mean, if we, if we start to imagine ourselves as beings who could achieve complete invulnerability to illness, or complete invulnerability to injury, then we're actually wishing away a bodily condition of life and, and perhaps engaging in a form of disavowing corporeality itself, which, which um, puts us at risk of engaging a kind of sovereign fantasy or a, a radically defensive one. I mean, um, even the best healthcare systems in the world cannot um, always fight cancer or succeed in triumphing over cancer. Even the most well-built buildings in the world cannot always withstand um, uh, floods and hurricanes. So we, we can't have the sense that um, we can achieve invulnerability. I think what we want is to, um, is to think about those social forms of organizing vulnerability disproportionately so that we can achieve greater equality and achieve less vulnerability of that kind. But I think we can't do that with, with, the, with the ideal or under the ideal of achieving radical invulnerability. I think that's just not possible and maybe also not valuable. Um, in Ayotzinapa, it is true that the students gathered in um, 2014 uh, to get on a bus and to go to Mexico City to commemorate a group of students who had 
gathered and gone to Mexico City in order to oppose uh, police violence and the cuts in educational benefits and um, uh, to, op to oppose violence in the area in which they were living. Um, uh, and, and these students in 2014 who went to commemorate those who had been killed in the course of exercising their rights to public assembly were also disappeared and are now presumed dead, although the family and friends of those people still say, we do not consider them dead, we are looking for them because we, the state has not yet given us the material evidence of this death. And as soon as we have the material evidence, which becomes the basis for a legal case against whoever did in fact kill them, um, uh, uh, they are not considered to be dead yet. So, so the family and friends are still holding to the legal idea of death. And you know, I think that you have um, experienced this here in many ways, trying to understand the conditions under which people are disappeared and killed and trying to get the legal um, evidence that can support uh, a legal case or a human rights case that exposes atrocities and disappearances. I mean, you know this in this part of the world very well. Um, I think there's always a risk of repetition. That public assembly in Ayotzinapa, they understood that they were taking a risk. I'm not sure they understood that the exact same thing would happen to them. But what was, of course, interesting to see in some of the local papers was how people Many, some people in the area just said, well, they brought it on themselves. Yeah, they, they, uh, uh, they courted destruction. They solicited death. Um, the same kinds of arguments are sometimes made about um, femicide or um, feminic feminicidio, which includes trans people, that they bring it on themselves by what? By appearing in public? by making demands by, or, or by, ex, by a, a mere existence that is considered to be objectionable to some. So I think um, there is always that risk. Uh, one enters into the same scene in order to make the scene turn out differently with knowing full well it may turn out to be the same or maybe not knowing full well, but the rest of us see that indeed that is the case. Um, uh, I don't know what to say about it except that my own government has been incredibly quiet on the Ayotzinapa killings as uh, a massive human rights violation and we can only imagine that certain economic contracts are sim or sim financial contracts are simply more important. So the selective, selective use of the human rights doctrine um, by the United States does not, uh, does not help matters. First of all, thank you very much for your amazing talk. I just can't say anything else but this. Uh, it made me think of a lot, a lot of things also happening in this region, in post Yugoslav region and Southeast Europe. Uh, one example that you mentioned in your talk uh, was the example of Roma. And uh, what I wanted to ask, here in the post Yugoslav region, there are a lot of Roma who are still legally invisible. And uh, it made me think whether there is any point where when the Biriti becomes uh, so um, th th that it prevents resistance. So for example, the one who is rendered invisible, that uh, uh, invisible and vulnerable is prevented from uh, having any resistance because of their position. So is there something as absolute vulnerability that cannot uh, go to resistance? And my other question uh, is not connected to this, but to uh, something, how does uh, securitization affect the relationship between vulnerability and uh, resistance? And here I'm referring mostly to the uh, latest terrorist attacks, uh, which are somehow constantly re redefining who is vulnerable and who is the one who is resisting. And I'm thinking about Ankara, Beirut, uh, Paris as well and so on, so that's my second question. Thank you very much. I would like to ask Judith to make an analysis between the differences between the differences between the binary dichotomy of the male and the female, 
iracionalno, racionalno i vulnerabilno, vulnerability resistance, pošto mislim da postoji neki ključ u u vezi te tri gde se na vulnerabilnost gleda jednako kao na ženskost i iracionalnost. Iako znamo da i smatra ih se kao da su manje vredne u konstituisanju bilo kog subjekta. Posebno tu bih volila da nam napravi njenu neku analizu. Tako da... I ja se isto zahvaljujem, no izvinjam se, imam tremu, ovo Judith Butler je ono neko kojim promenio moj život. Moja pitanja je da se considera viktimizaciju i vulnerabiliti, jer kada se pitanja viktima, se pitanja vulnerabiliti. Moja pitanja je da se pitanja distinguiti vulnerabiliti od viktima, od viktimizaciju. Well, I think there are there are a couple of different things to say about invisibility. I mean, some people would argue that there are forms of internet resistance, resistance on the web that depend on a relative invisibility, um, and and even a way of escaping from the um, the sphere of appearance, the public sphere, uh, in a visual sense, uh, that actually make make it possible to have uh, agency under conditions of securitarian rule, right? So a, so a wild or unregulated internet can sometimes be precisely a, um, a mechanism for, for agency that otherwise could not be um, uh, uh, expressed or articulated under um, censorship or authoritarian rule or securitarian rule. Um, the Roma, of course, their invisibility to the extent that they are invisible um, uh, is another matter. I, I, I found that question interesting because I believe you said they are legally invisible. That is to say they don't appear within the terms of the law. But of course they do appear. They line the streets, they line the docks, they are very often um, at the borders. Um, and the question is, what is that mode of appearance that is extra um, juridical, that is extra legal, that is outside the law? And how is that managed? How is it, um, is, that, is, that, is that also um, uh, dismissed or, um, or, or is, is that mobilized for other reasons? Um, of course, there are, um, conditions under which the possibility for resistance is minimal. And we can think about detention camps, or we can think about um, torture or death. Uh, there's, there's not a lot that can be done, but maybe um, the, it's not, we, we should think not just about those who are suffering or have suffered or are gone, like the Ayotzinapa students, but what do we do in the aftermath of that death or in the aftermath of that torture? How do we bring it to light? How do we historically analyze it? How do we make the claim of justice on the basis of that history? So part of me thinks um, that there's a broader political question of how and where representation of the Roma becomes possible and whether resistance isn't more or less a global responsibility uh, uh, rather than the question of can the Roma resist? Yes, sometimes true, they can, and we could think about uh, daily acts of resistance, um, but perhaps there's also a broader strategy of resistance that needs to be um, uh, engaged by those of us who um, live in a world in which legal expulsion has has unfortunately become uh, a, a norm within within certain countries. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm aware that we're in a a very um, frightening um, uh, moment right now, where the attacks on Ankara or the attacks on Beirut or Paris produce a desire for or a ratification for a securitarian state in which basic democratic freedoms are suspended. 
And this is um, a, a vicious cycle that has to be resisted in some ways. Uh, the securitarian state functions in part because of a um, um, because of a, a more general um, fear um, of these attacks, and, and of course we all can identify with that and have doubtless felt that fear either ourselves or through um, some some form of 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 some in our experience of, of these events elsewhere. Uh, but I do think that we are um, uh, we are going to have to have a multi-faceted uh, strategy to defend democratic rights against the securitarian state and to oppose both state-based violence and non-statist violence. Right? I think until we get a broader analysis of the kinds of violence we oppose, which are, I mean, legal violence, state violence, but non-statist violence, or even aspirational state violence, I don't know how to put it, um, uh, I, I think that, that that has to become part of a radical democratic movement. So nothing, to, for me, could be more promising than a global struggle for radical democracy on nonviolent grounds. I know that I'm very idealistic, but someone has to be. What if there were no <laughs> idealists left? What if we were all so realistic, right, that we don't even think? Okay. Um, okay, so victim, vulnerability, immunization. Um, look, there, there. It's not as if there is no victimization. There is victimization. I'm just claiming that victimization ought not to be the only model or paradigm through which we understand vulnerability. And we can even track historically m moves of victimization through the mobilization of vulnerability, which suggests that we are not, if we are vulnerable, only victims, or we are not fated to be victims by virtue of our vulnerability, where we are victims when and where we are by virtue of victimizing forms of power, right? So it's not vulnerability that makes us the victim, it's rather uh, those forms of power that do in fact victimize. So I don't mean to suggest that that doesn't exist or we shouldn't be thinking about victimization, I just don't think that we should allow victimization to become the only way we think about vulnerability. We, we miss a resource, a political resource, um, that's terribly important. Um, the, the, the reference to immunization is an interesting one. I hear echoes of, of Derrida there, uh, the, the critique of autoimmunity. Um, I, I think, I think the, the truth is we, we cannot fully inoculate ourselves against um, injury of all kinds, but we can um, perhaps uh, think of, a, of an, another model, which is um, to understand ourselves as endurable, as fragile, precarious, vulnerable, and as persistent, and as enraged, and as, um, and as gaining um, a, a, a sense of the strength of our action precisely through collective means that avow our, the social and inter interdependent character of our lives. Um, I think I'll just end there. Thank you. Thank you.